Hello, good morning London, good afternoon Brussels and good evening from here in Singapore. My name is Lutfi Siddiqui and I'm delighted to host today's Meet the Leaders session on behalf of LEC Ideas, the foreign policy think tank of the London School of Economics. This series is primarily aimed at students and alumni of the flagship Executive Masters in Diplomacy and Strategy. The idea is to have a fairly relaxed fireside chat with a distinguished practitioner, weaving their personal and professional leadership journey with world affairs. Before I introduce our guest, a few housekeeping points. This event will be recorded and the recording will likely be posted online soon afterwards. Uh, we have up to one hour for this conversation. The idea is to make it as interactive as possible. So please post your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom as we go along. Uh, don't wait for the end. And after a set of questions from me, we'll move quickly to your questions from the audience. Okay, so I'm really excited now to welcome Dr. Ailish Campbell. Ailish Campbell has, uh, was appointed Canada's ambassador to the EU in October 2020. The EU is Canada's second largest trade partner, and in her immediately preceding role, she was Canada's chief trade commissioner, having been a trade negotiator all the way back to the WTO Doha round of 2002. She has a doctorate in international relations from Oxford, and very importantly, she has a master's from the London School of Economics. I've known Ailish now for five or six years. We've been on panels together. She was kind enough to host me in Ottawa when I visited a couple of years ago. I confess I remain a little starstruck. She's not only an accomplished diplomat, she's a bundle of technical knowledge, uh, amazing warmth, amazing generosity. I'm really delighted that she's here with us today. Ailish, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you, and, and what a thrill to be with you as well. And I commend you for putting this together while I understand you are in quarantine in Singapore, if that's right. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So well done. Uh, thank you, I'm, I'm glad uh, we were able to make this work. So I'd like to start at the beginning, if I may, your origin story. What was the path to your becoming a, a government official, a public official? Was it a clear goal? Was it a set of circumstances? Was it accidental? Uh, what's the origin story? Wow. Well, it, it was just uh, May 4th yesterday, the Star Wars uh, celebration day, and uh, Princess Leia was always my heroine growing up. So I'm, I'm quite conscious you've asked a pretty epic question in that origin story. But you know what? To, to really distill it down, um, I think I've always been interested in public service. Uh, Canada is uh, a fantastic country, very multicultural, but also very focused on its relationship with the United States. So I think my, my interest was always uh, how to bring Canada into even a more global uh, perspective. Certainly our, our G7 membership is a strong aspect of that, but with deep history and relationships uh, here in Europe, and I'm very conscious, I'm actually the second member of my family to serve in Europe, but the first one was in the Second World War. This was my grandfather who fought the entire Second World War, um, marching up Italy, uh, liberating uh, villages here in Belgium. So it is, an, it is an absolute honor to be kind of part of that story, uh, but also to bring Canada, I think where, where you and I've done a lot of work um, is with Asia. So kind of setting out, coming to uh, the London School of Economics and, and knowing that I had a real interest uh, in, in focusing on making Canada uh, an even more globalized, uh, stronger multilateral partner, but really not knowing when I arrived uh, at LSE for my master's degree in 1997, how that might, uh, how that might roll out. I see. Um, were there, so it looks like uh, it was pretty clear to you that this is broadly where you would want to be. Um, were there some specific challenges or setbacks in those early, early years? Yes, I, I, I think it's really important, particularly if it, we, we have some students and, and masters and PhD students joining us, you know, there's nothing inevitable uh, about where people end up and it can all look rather path dependent. 
Uh, but I can assure you 23 years ago, when I arrived at the London School of Economics, uh, I, I, I knew that I wanted to develop specific skills. So I really focused my master's degree um, you know, in, in economic analysis, understanding the EU institutions, a lot of trade economics. But at the time, frankly, I did not know how to break in you know, to the areas that, uh, that I was interested in. Uh, furthermore, sitting the, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of government departments have uh, what I call an in from the mailroom and work your way up to the top model. You know, it's not a terribly dynamic labor market. And I had already done uh, work in the private sector. So I actually was, was in the private sector uh, doing consulting and contracting work, uh, had focused my time in England and really came into the government uh, thinking that I was only going to be there on a contract for, for a limited amount of time and then might come back out, use my PhD and teach. So, you know, here I am 20 years later, all I can say is, you know, it's, it's good to recontract every two or three years. Ask yourself if you're in the right place, ask who else you know. Um, but I think breaking in was, was the hardest part. And in that sense, you know, very much happy to hear from, from students and also help answer questions, not, you know, even on this Zoom, but um, you, people can find me on LinkedIn and, and see how they can brainstorm, you know, who their network is, how do they get in. And my number one message, uh, certainly it worked for me, is if you're offered an opportunity, you know, even if it's sort of adjacent to your ideal position, take it. The most important thing is to get your foot in the door um, and also start building your network, which I think begins with the incredible opportunities offered at the London School of Economics itself. Fantastic. Was there a break-in moment for you or was it just keeping at it and it happened over time? Was there a threshold moment? Yeah, there, there was a threshold moment. I think interestingly enough, I, I was resisting going back to Canada. I was really enjoying uh, my time in Europe. Um, I had lived and worked at that point uh, in, in Ireland, Sweden, Greece. I, I had spent about eight months in Athens at that point um, and, and was back in London and really wasn't sure I wanted to go home and then was given an opportunity. Very clearly, I think the Canadian government realized that they, they wanted to recruit more people uh, who had studied abroad. And so a kind of spontaneous entrepreneurial moment by a deputy minister, he was sent out to, uh, to talk to students who had been um, both at NCAD in France, obviously Canada has a very deep relationship uh, with France and the French uh, education institutions and in the UK and the US. And uh, he kind of, su he suggested to me, I might say, uh, listen, kid, this is your, this is your chance and, and take it. And you know, if you don't like it, you can always leave in a year or two. So this was a unique recruitment program started again by, I think a, a real entrepreneur, a chap named George Anderson, who then was our deputy minister of natural resources. And I'm, I'm really proud to share that a good number of us turned this into an annual recruitment process for the Canadian Federal Public Service called the Recruitment of Policy Leaders. The RPL program now can recruit not only internationally, that was George's objective when he founded the program about 20 years ago, but we can now hire uh, people with career experience, and MA and PhD experiences who are based in Canada as well. So a little bit more entrepreneurship in the, in the government is always welcome. Wow, wow, that's, uh, that's terrific. Um, so that's, that's a positive story. I, I don't want to dampen it, but I, I do have <laughs> a question that I want to ask and get out of the way. So let me do that right away. The European Commission president, Ursula von der Leyen recently spoke about sexism. This is in the context of Sofagate and how she felt even at this stage of her career, at this stage of seniority. So my question is a very general, it's a general one to you. Perhaps uh, you have advice for female members of the audience, some of whom are in the same profession, early stages. How prevalent was or is gender bias in the course of your professional journey? Yeah, great question. So on, on gender bias, uh, I'm gonna say three things. The first is at a systemic level. It is absolutely prevalent, it's, it's systemic, and it exists in all contexts. Even the most advanced economies, such as Canada's, continue to have uh, wage differentials for women. 
Um, hiring practices are really good, but what we see is that women thin out, frankly, until they reach senior management positions. And particularly, and I, I've experienced this myself when I had our two children, getting back into the labor market um, and getting promotions after you've had your children. So it, it is absolutely systemic. And I think we need to talk about it. We need to name it. And you should ask, you know, your manager, your corporation, you know, what their plan is to manage uh, and make more transparent and correct for systemic gender bias. It's, of course, far more difficult uh, in some cultures. Um, and, and we have lessons to learn, in fact, uh, from cultures as diverse as um, in, in Africa, where there are far more uh, female parliamentarians, for example, um, but also looking, I think, at Fortune 500 companies, you know, anywhere we can learn lessons, let's do it. The second thing I'll say is, it is also, though, a really individual experience. So certainly as a white woman, um, I, I feel that I've had lots of advantages. And the challenge now, I think, is for our public service and our uh, private sector, uh, even in Canada, to become far more diverse uh, particularly for Indigenous and Black Canadians who are underrepresented at our senior levels. We still have work to do. Um, but pick your boss, because the best boss, and this is what I say about an individual experience, um, the best boss, like I was fortunate to have, I had a series of male bosses. I pretty much only had male bosses for a good portion of my career. I was in male-dominated teams for a good portion of my career. Uh, but these were men that were absolute allies, totally respectful, totally dedicated um, to uh, supporting me, not just as a member of a team, um, but as a woman. And there were many times where I just felt, and that's the best feeling in the world, no matter what your gender, color, religion, race, just to feel like a member of the team that's totally valued for who you are. And I'm very grateful for those leaders. Um, and, you know, on the sofa gate issue, what I can say is, you know, individual relationships matter. You know, if, if you feel respected, even inside of a systemically, challenging context you know those relationships can make a difference and make you feel empowered so then the last thing i'll say is each of us has to take actions and and we're on this call with you know a, a myriad of people both um, experienced leaders uh students every single one of us can take actions to to make our team members uh feel better to feel more included and uh you know i also think last thing i'll say is there are going to be uncomfortable conversations. You know, you're going to have to ask questions that you may, you're not going to know the answer to. And, and that's okay. That's good. But, you know, again, in a healthy work and personal environment, people will be honest about the challenges that we're having. And I know you're a champion uh, for women. You have a strong wife. You know, you have, you're raising great kids. Uh, part of this is what we're doing with our children that I work on every day to raise not only a daughter, but also a son uh, that are feminists. Yeah, hope that helps. I'm sure that's, well, certainly helpful to me and I'm sure uh, to, to people watching and listening in as well. And a reminder to members of the audience, please uh, feel free to start posting your questions through the Q&A function uh, as you have them. And I see that I have, uh, I see one which I will come back to a little bit later. Let me, uh, uh, fast forward, Ailish, to uh, your time as Chief Trade Commissioner. Um, it was a historic period in time. Uh, I think in that time we saw uh, the renegotiation of NAFTA, uh, the signing of TPP, or what became CPTPP. Um, I think the, the Canada-EU deal, the CETA, was also signed in this period. Uh, and of course, you would have observed the UK leave the EU also at that time. So let's talk a little bit about that period. What's your, what's your overriding memory of, let's pick one, let's say the NAFTA-USMCA negotiation. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I think what's so fascinating about the arc of, of, of our careers, because you and I are contemporaries, is there really was that kind of Francis Fukuyama moment, end of history, where we're really bringing in more members into the multilateral trading system, certainly those of us who are dedicated to the World Trade Organization. And by the way, if you want to see a, an international organization with good gender balance for the first time in history, a female and an African 
uh, director general. And yesterday they hired four new deputy director generals at the WTO, two women, two men. It can be done. I actually think all this is much more simple than, than we realize. Excellence is everywhere. But um, to get back to your question, I think we had that moment where we were like, okay, we're on this path um, of globalization, uh, of, of you know, free movement of the factors of production. And we're really going to solve uh, you know, for the tensions and areas of, of differences. I think a lot changed during the global financial crisis, the retrenchment, uh, the, the focus back on domestic policies, also a sense of systemic risk and how to manage that. So I think when I think also too about the last five years, the key feeling I have is, wow, I was really taking a lot for granted in terms of the interoperability of systems, in terms of uh, mutually agreed objectives, and uh, as well that in pursuing economic relations, we were really helping to build the domestic capacity to empower more people, certainly uh, as Bob Zellick, the former USTR, has written extensively about lifting more people you know, out of poverty through economic openness, through trade, um, but and also you know an improvement on human rights and i think you know a number of systemic shocks the global financial crisis uh i think a change in u.s foreign policy where multilateralism and alliance building was less the focus than individual deals right and um uh, a, a focus on deal making more on a one-on-one -on -one level. That that was a fundamental change for us. I think Canada has committed and and is going to be relentless in its pursuit of the rule of law, multilateralism, international alliances, whether that's security, whether it's on human rights uh, or on trade. And and it's it's taught us not to take things for granted, but also I think more care and feeding in the alliances that we need to build. And for us, the European Union and the United Kingdom, as well as the US, Japan and other partners, you know, remain the firmament uh, of those alliances. But they, they require, as I said, uh, more intentionality, more care, um, and particularly as we layer on climate action uh, and, and marrying up what I think have been some, some silos in discussions, the, the environment and energy conversation has absolutely moved into the business, finance, and economic discussion. Um, and that's, that's, again, a real opportunity, but also a whole range of complexity that I think uh, I certainly, for one, wasn't anticipating, but which I think is going to be the, the watchword or the, the areas of focus for the rest of my career, certainly. Terrific. That's, so that's one. Let's take another one, if I may. So, And I'm thinking of it particularly from the perspective of aspiring diplomats or students of trade mm. negotiations. What happened towards the end of the TPP negotiation when from the outside it looked like Canada stepped away, then you, you sort of recut it as the comprehensive plan that it ended up as. What was going on there? Give us a feel for that, please. Yeah, sure. I think there is always a moment. And so this is, you know, the difference between being, you know, a first time trade negotiator, um, but also, um, and I should say we have incredible chief trade negotiators. I was playing a supporting role uh, as, as the chief trade commissioner more with our business community and our set of services to exporters, but having kind of uh, supported the, the business engagement um, and, and the database for these negotiations, it, it's kind of always darkest before the dawn. There's always a moment uh, where the final negotiations um, are, are crystallizing. And I think that's a really tense and important moment on a couple of vectors. First and foremost, has there been a political change during the negotiations? So as a democracy, you're trying to create not only an effective and implementable agreement, but also a politically sustainable one. Um, and I think, you know, I commend all negotiators who, in, you know, technical experts who keep negotiations going uh, during election periods. And of course, we've also just seen one in the United States. And so for us, we had a transition during both uh, the comprehensive um, economic and, and trade agreement with 
uh, with the European Union and during uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership from a conservative to a liberal government. Uh, so it's always important to understand what new dimensions, um, including I would say even more environmental and labor provisions, uh, provisions on, for example, small and medium-sized enterprises that become a priority for a new government alongside the digital, the trade, the services piece. So you have a, how do we sustain this agreement over a, a change in government? Um, secondly, there's always that last uh, crystallizing moment where people realize, um, you know, they've got to sell the deal politically. So there's a, a transition from what's been an intense multi-year period of technical negotiations to the final sign-off by our political bosses, by our masters, who have to then explain this deal to Canadians, have to bring it through Parliament, you know, or through Congress. Um, and that then also, you know, uh, takes, I think, some, some refinement. And in our case, a structural moment where the U.S. decided not to continue to pursue the Trans-Pacific Partnership and did the other partners want to continue. And I'm thrilled uh, that with the energy, uh, the commitment, the dynamism uh, of really deepening uh, commitment on some of the, the rules-based order, uh, the digital trade, also trade and services, rules and disciplines on state-owned enterprises, Canada, Japan, Vietnam, an incredible uh, powerhouse of an economy that's just uh, growing, as well as Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and our other partners, were able to stay at the table despite this kind of fundamental shock. And I do like to say that we're keeping a seat warm uh, for our American cousins. We, we really needed them to launch this agreement. And I, I continue to hear from businesses across North America that they'd like to see the United States back in. That's, of course, a decision for uh, President Biden and, and his government. But I think we've shown as well in the Canada-US, NAFTA uh, renegotiations alongside Mexico, that we can bring in these new elements, that a strong and prosperous middle class, that a strong uh, sense of um, focus on labor elements of these deals is absolutely possible, as right. well as stronger environmental provisions. So new models. And a very useful reminder that deals have to be implementable and politically sustainable. If they're not ratified, there's no point uh, in, in doing them. Or if they're changed with a change of government, uh, they're not durable. Um, let me take a couple of questions from the floor and I'll go back to the questions I have for the next chapter of, uh, of, of your professional life, which is now here in Brussels. Uh, so the questions, there's one from Asha, there's one from Chris. I'll take them in, in this order. So Asha is asking, as a feminist in government, how did you engage with feminist activists or NGOs during trade negotiations? And was it difficult to give such groups a meaningful voice among all the bureaucracy, mm. priorities of business interests, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, listen, I think leadership really matters. So in this case, with um, uh, a prime minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, who's totally dedicated uh, to um, what we call a gender-based analysis plus. So uh, this, this means that every policy we promulgate, including trade negotiations, has to be looked at from multivariate social perspectives. This includes not only the experience of women, but uh, different kinds, different, different life experiences of women, um, as well as those who are differently abled, indigenous women. And, and I'll tell you, it, it, it has not been difficult to make space uh, because I think the quality of engagement has been so good uh, based on uh, good statistical information, uh, based on real life case studies and examples, uh, based on access as well, you know, it's not just that you create a free trade agreement, and I think this is the key point I want to make, that the legal negotiation of a trade agreement is one moment. And so have different types of traders and exporters, foreign affiliates and investors been considered during these negotiations. And that's where we've added new chapters, for example, in e-commerce, where we see many more women creating their own businesses uh, finding finance for their businesses. But it's not just in the moment of the negotiations. And, and by the way, one of my favorite tariff facts, if you'll allow me just for a moment, is the ridiculous tariffs that we still place on women's undergarments. These are one of the most tariffed uh, products in the world. 
uh, just to amuse you, you know, uh, we had the multi-fiber agreement. So, you know, we've had all kinds of like a basket of focus of goods. Um, and we're going to continue, you know, uh, as we work on some of the newer areas, inclu including digital um, services, it's it's all the basket of goods that, that women buy that men don't, that we also frankly have to focus on and from a consumer perspective to make uh, kind of life as affordable as possible. But then when I look at once a trade agreement exists, it is really important that we look at the services women exporters are provided. And so in that sense, it's not just feminist organizations or groups. It's, it's literally every single female owned business who has a chance to provide feedback to our trade commissioner service, to our export credit agency, Export Development Canada, and our business development bank for small business, BDC, who will have the first female CEO, by the way, in its history, um, and current ambassador to France, Isabel Houdon, who will be our, the CEO of BDC. We're really looking for all that real-time feedback, and that's what makes, I would say, digital government all the more important. So, so I started with leadership, which is direction from the top, but I'll end with the fact that this engagement has to be constant, and we have to be using real-time tools surveys, um, uh, online surveys, online engagement uh, to reach women when it's convenient for them. The days of nine to five government and uh, call me, you know, when it, when it conveniences me is, is no longer the way governments should operate if they're looking for that kind of feedback uh, from women, but also I think other groups who we need to include more actively in our policies. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you for that, Eilish. The next question from Chris is a different angle. Um, Canadian national versus provincial policies. So let me read it out. Um, I'm thinking in particular of how the policies in areas such as climate change and responsible governance of natural resources at national level differ from that of provinces, sometimes in quite jarring ways. For instance, the Canadian mining sector, particularly mid-sized firms often criticized in Africa or South America for apparently poor practices and environmental mm. uh, issues or addressing local community concerns. Can you shed some light on this? Yeah, sure. I, th I think there's two possibly big questions in there. So, you know, the first might be on a delta between federal and provincial policies. And of course, some amount of, uh, differentiation exists, but when it comes to environmental policies, um, this is why you've seen, I think, a much more uh, robust and activist set of federal policies so that um, any gaps or gap filling can occur. And specifically, I'm thinking here of our work on the pan-Canadian carbon price, uh, which does allow each province to have its own carbon pricing uh, scheme, its own, its own uh, particular uh, set of factors. But there is a federal backstop such that if um, minimum, um, minimum amounts of coverage, uh, also prices are not met, there is a federal backstop behind that. So, um, you know, I take note, there's many areas that we could talk about here, including healthcare. During the pandemic, this has been a top issue globally, and it is implemented in Canada by our provinces. So there are, you know, differentiating, uh, differential capabilities. And I think that's also why uh, a federal uh, agenda that includes looking at the time it takes to get certain services and that has the fiscal capacity to do transfers uh, to bring up healthcare systems so that there is comparability across Canada is really important. If I look at the question around mining, I think the, the most important thing I can say is that first and foremost, this is why we, this is why we as diplomats do the work that we do. It's to empower the national governments and bring even more state capacity, uh, legal institutional capacity. It's why Canada, for example, one of our strongest international development assistance, uh, I think offerings in partnership with developing countries is on institution building. It's in building effective uh, tax systems through IMF and OECD programs, but it's also through uh, judicial and police training that we do in order to create national capacities. Because first and foremost, we want countries to be able to enforce the environmental and labor provisions that they have determined are appropriate for their national setting. But insofar as the question may be um, about behaviors 
There could be corruption involved. I think that's an important thing to talk about. Uh, but where uh, we can bring up the uh, standards, uh, and in including environmental stewardship that we expect from Canadian companies, I just highlight our work on corporate social responsibility or uh, what Minister Champagne, our former Minister of International Trade, uh, led him to create the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise. So there is not only a Canadian entity where NGOs, labor organizations, or individuals can uh, raise issues or complaints to, but we also, of course, are very active in the OECD and UN systems that provide uh, framework policies for environmental stewardship, uh, the ILO core labor conventions, and human rights. I'm not hearing any sound. So I'm going to ask you, <coughs> if you might be on mute. Yes, there uh, you are. Sorry, can you hear me now? Can you Absolutely. hear me now? Absolutely. Great. Okay. Uh, I will now ask you one of my questions and go back to the Q&A box in a moment. Um, let's talk about your appointment as ambassador to the EU. And I believe you're the first female um, ambassador in, in this role. And I've had the good fortune of getting to know um, some other very strong female ambassadors from Canada. There's Deborah Leons, who was an ambassador to Israel when I met her. And there's Elissa Goldberg, our friend. Um, uh, your appointment, first female ambassador to the EU from Canada. You moved with your lovely family during the pandemic, September of last year to Brussels, what was that like? Yeah, you know, b before I talk about the personal element of that, let me just say, I do think we're at an inflection point uh, for, for female leadership in the Canadian government. Um, and it is because we've had uh, a focus um, on achieving gender parity with, as, as I say, much more representation to come in my you know, personal view. But our first female ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Kirsten Hillman, um, uh, our first female ambassador to, to France, Isabelle Houdon, and uh, also our high commissioner, uh, Janet Charette. Uh, Janet Charette. So it, it was really just quite, it really is quite incredible how with, with a focus and uh, again, if the CEO or the board say, we have this objective, let me tell you, uh, talented women, are out there. And I think now our challenge is, as I say, to make sure that we are even more representative of, of Canada, uh, including um, on Indigenous uh, and representation of all Canada's culture. So more work to do. Uh, but you asked about moving during the pandemic. Uh, you know, it, it, was a, it was a bit of a wild idea, I don't mind telling you. And you kind of have to willfully suspend some of the more rational elements of your brain that, you know, of course, tell you just hunker down. Um, but, you know, really fortunate, an incredible team here. Uh, I have an incredible team of professionals that I work with. Um, the most important thing was to keep my family together. So at one point I was asked, oh, would you like to go early? And we'll make sure that your husband and your children follow you. And we, we had had cases, of course, of our colleagues, a little bit like you right now uh, in Singapore, uh, trying to get, you know, trying to figure out how to live a global life while managing quarantine and, and it, it's tough. So we've had, we had families that were separated. Um, I think the hardest thing about the last year, other than of course, the shock of the pandemic and the incredible, the incredibly uh, difficult moments, certain countries, um, you know, Italy uh, bearing the brunt of, of the first uh, wave in Europe, obviously the China trying to get on top of, uh, of the breakout in Wuhan and now in India where we just you know, send not only our, our thoughts to our colleagues, but where Canada, the UK, the EU are actively sending oxygen and medicine and medical support uh, to India. That's incredibly important. Um, but I think the other you know, kind of maybe less discussed issue, because we're not quite out of the health crisis, is the mental health aspect of all of this. And I think keeping families apart um, we've had people separated from their families for months at a time. And, and I knew if I had the choice, I certainly wanted to move, uh, you know, with my family together. The, the, the best thing that I have for my mental health uh, is, is time with the children and, and, you know, times that I can really switch off my, 
my phone and my laptop and all the other uh, devices for a couple of hours. So I, I'd be interested in how you're building your, your mental resilience and fortitude, because I think that's probably the most important topic we could talk about other than fighting the pandemic. Right, certainly. Um, and I might have a small contribution to make to, to that at the end of my 21 days here in, in this room. Uh, I'll let you know. Um, so there are two specific questions about uh, trade treaties. Before I come to those, let me ask you a general question about your role as the lead diplomatic representative to the EU for Canada. The global backdrop is, uh, there's clearly a period of heightened geopolitics. There's heightened geoeconomic tension, maybe even deglobalization or forces of deglobalization. Yeah. How do you exercise diplomacy on that backdrop? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, a very experienced diplomat uh, once said to me, diplomacy is the art of talking. If you're not talking, it's hard to do diplomacy. Um, it's, it's also hard to do trade negotiations, you know, if you're not at the table. So I think the challenge for all of us, and, and we're all working through the modalities, the tools, uh, the different, I think, important aspects of a relationship. Um, bilateral, multilateral relationships are very complicated. And there is no, there are no two countries in the world. There's not, there's not a country, uh, certainly a democratic nation, uh, that that is uh, doesn't have tensions and issues to resolve. So how could that possibly be the case um, in diplomacy? But I think there's some firmaments. Uh, some of those are our values. You know, we will absolutely disagree when it comes to the rights of the individual, when it comes to human rights um, such as freedom of expression. Uh, but also individual human rights. And, and I think those are, are really well known, but it, it becomes, again, something that we just cannot take for granted. We're seeing here in the EU some backsliding around, for example, women's rights and access to abortion. We're seeing disinformation actively uh, and in a, in a clearly documented uh, set of cases occur from Russia with interference in, in, in domestic um, domestic elections, but as well in information about vaccines. And so it is incredibly important uh, to name those issues, to more actively combat them again, you know, in democracies, not to take um, our freedom of expression, but also the quality uh, of our journalism. Yesterday was World Journalism uh, Free Press Day. And so how do we continue to support quality uh, journalism and quality uh, investigative journalism from the fourth estate that in so many cases has proven integral alongside our more formal political institutions. So I think in that sense, you're going to see Canada continue to engage. We've had, um, you know, on the international level, I could also just talk about um, our my colleague, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, who are being illegally detained by China. Uh, that is, that, that issue of arbitrary detention uh, is a key area of uh, discussion with our Chinese counterparts at the same time as we keep up engagement on climate change, on applications of, of clean technology, and of course, collaboration on the pandemic. So I, I sometimes like to remind people, you know, we have, it, it looks, it, you know, it looks simple maybe from the outside, but we have a deeply complex, rich relationship with the United States of America. That includes, of course, people to people linkages, B to B, uh, it includes, uh, of course, our strong de democratic institutions, uh, but it also includes areas of, of, of disagreement and tension. And I think that's the real test of greatness is in how countries resolve some of those areas where they have a fundamental disagreement on values, uh, but how they can continue to stay engaged. Uh, Canada's values are clear. They're, they're not up for compromise. That's what Canadians expect. Um, but at the same time, we can't be, uh, I think, reductionist. Uh, you use the word decoupling. Um, when you dig into the data, it's clear that, again, multivariate complex relationships could see an area of disengagement uh, at one time, 
but continued um, uh, even deeper engagement in other areas. So it's up to us to really uh, communicate clearly where that's happening um, across a whole range of issues. It's, it's what makes our job, I think, so interesting and rich. Uh, but it's, it's also, frankly, why governments around the world have created diplomatic institutions to serve not only as their eyes and ears, um, but also as a potential and additional channel uh, for discussions. And uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's, that's where the judgment is, the, the science, but as well as the art of, of diplomacy come into play. It's going to make, where you just landed this, is going to make um, answering my next question extremely easy. I was actually going to um, be slightly cheeky and say, in this day <laughs> of digital communications and right. um, instant communication, do we need diplomats? Do we need that intermediation of having an emissary and an envoy on the ground? Yeah, that's a great question. And I want to commend countries that are doing digital engagement well, because I, I think they're really pushing the envelope in terms of public communications. So this isn't just, you know, my job is to do government to government, you know, really G to G type of relations. Uh, to solve the thorniest uh, business issues. Um, you know, those are really complex, naughty problems uh, that include things like, you know, governments that may want to appropriate an asset or a difficult relationship um, concerning um, overflight rights or how to exchange and keep data, um, for example, on airline passengers, all in a context where we're where we are respecting uh, privacy and adhering to different national laws on data retention. That, that's, you know, you've got diplomats for that. But there's a, an incredibly important aspect to diplomacy, and it's all of a country's assets. It's not just diplomats. Um, it's our press. It's our cultural institutions. Um, you know, in, in Canada, uh, I, I take note that the, the Canadian with the largest amount of followers is probably Drake. Uh, so how does he represent Toronto when the Raptors won the NBA championships, that was, if you'll allow me, kind of a diplomatic moment too. You know, how do people see dynamic democracies, um, immigrant-friendly, diverse economies and societies like Canada from a whole multitude of perspectives? And that's absolutely where, you know, private sector and entertainment and cultural actors are using digital tools in far more exciting and interesting ways than the government. Um, but I do take note particularly of, of, of your government, of the, the, your adopted uh, home country, Singapore. Uh, but I would also say Estonia really stands out for me uh, as a country that's using all of its digital tools to try and bring the deepest value proposition for its citizens in terms of digital services. But then also, I think, to create uh, a, a real impression you know, the number of hits or impressions or favorable views of a country internationally. And anyone who thinks that uh, government has the monopoly on that, uh, it, you know, is, uh, is, is really out of touch. And, and again, it's an area where I think government has a lot to learn from others. That being said, right now, we maintain our monopoly over your passport, Lufty. There's, there's no Drake-issued passport uh, available yet that I'm aware of. So, so we'll, we'll retain, I think, uh, some deep fundamental value added uh, for citizens. But it's that constant question, you know, are we doing our best? How can we use um, other tools? And that's why Canada is really excited to be part of the, the D9, the Digital 9. It, it's actually a group of countries that's growing more and more. Um, uh, other countries are joining us to ask these kinds of questions. Um, and frankly, try to keep us nimble. Agile and nimble are not the words you usually associate with government, uh, but we've got, uh, we've got work to do and certainly I'm committed. Uh, I think digital and digitization of our services is one of my greatest passions and it's where we need more young people. Uh, it's where we need more skilled professionals disrupting and joining government to ask those kinds of questions and frankly tell mid-career professionals like me there's a better way of doing things. That's great. It's so it's multivariate and it's both offline and online. I, I failed right. to, to get you defensive. I was hoping to you'd <laughs> come up saying, no, it's it's the human touch that matters and over everything else. Um, let's take two questions from the Q&A box. We have two questions, one from Robin and one from Michael. Both are from LSE. 
Robin's question is about SETA. Um, I would be curious to hear Dr. Campbell's interpretation of the agreements provisional application so far. Mm. Is there evidence of significant trade creation, either in aggregate terms or in certain sectors? Are there any policy areas where the agreement has not lived up, lived up to expectations? Well, that's a great question. And, and it's one that my my bosses, the, the Deputy Minister of, of Foreign Affairs, Marta Morgan, and, and uh, Minister, Minister Garneau, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, and, and my former um, and direct boss, Minister Mary Ng, the Minister of International Trade, Small Business and Trade Diversification. Of, you know, this is like why they put me here. So how, how has trade expanded? You know, it's all in the numbers. Uh, there's an overall increase if we go to 2016 when uh, CETA uh, was implemented to today. Um, there's a, a, an overall increase uh, of about 20% of exports on our side, 25% increase on the EU side. Even during the 2020 pandemic, um, certainly Canada's exports to the EU uh, did not dramatically shrink. They, in fact, even in this huge demand shock and supply chain disruption actually stayed flat and we saw some of our exports grow. Canada in particular, are fantastic food security partners. So it has, it has proven itself on that vector. Secondly, I would say the number of small businesses using the preferential rates that we negotiated in the agreement. Uh, we're now seeing a utilization rate. This is a key test, it's sort of one of the behind the scenes tests that all trade negotiators or those measuring the effectiveness of agreements should look at. Are the preferential rates being used? And we can see that a growing number, now it's, it's over 55 and headed towards 60% of businesses trading with the EU are using the preferential access. And then we have to ask ourselves, why is a business not using it? Either because they don't know about it, we haven't made it easy enough for them. On a one-off transaction, for example, they, they may not find it useful to do the, the, the kind of accreditation, the paperwork on rules of origin that you need in order to get uh, that preferential rate. But for the vast majority of businesses, this is a totally useful tool. We see some countries, a real standout, for example, um, that I seem to recall is Sweden, over 70% of businesses using the preferential rate. So how do we learn the best practices of those countries who've really got their businesses using all the tools at their disposal? I, I hope that's you know, a little taste of the fact that this agreement has mattered, uh, that it has created trade. We've also seen more businesses start to export to the EU. That's a key test, you know, an increase of over 500 uh, new exporters using, for example, some of our services to gain access to the EU. Um, and I think the most important thing to highlight is, uh, because you talked about provisional application, long story short, the EU is a really complicated place. I'm learning a lot by being here. Uh, the agreement is under both EU competency and of course does involve some member state competencies. So it's considered provisionally in place until all member states have ratified the agreement nationally. But it means uh, that effective as of today, 99% uh, of all of the benefits negotiated are already in place, already in force. Um, and that's why I'm able to offer you some of that uh, data. Uh, we just had our second joint committee, which involves uh, both the most senior levels of officials as well as our ministers who met uh, to discuss the agreement and we'll keep improving it and sustainable development, biotech products. I take note that the incredible mRNA vaccines uh, that the EU, the European Union, has been our top exporter of vaccines to Canada. Um, just a huge thank you to the European uh, institutions, the EU member states, and our strong co contracts with Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, we've been able to import from the EU vaccines. Those mRNA vaccines are biotech products. It's an area that takes far too long uh, for products to be authorized. And we're hoping some of the newer dynamic elements of the agreement um, help us reduce some of that time it takes to get a product uh, approved, certified, and ready for uh, sales in the European Union. Thank you. Next question from Michael. The UK has applied to join Canada in the CPTPP. How is this application being received in Brussels and Ottawa? And what challenges do you find 
in balancing Canadian, UK and EU relationships. Right. Well, this isn't your grandfather's trade policy anymore. So it isn't just about supply chains. You know, it's about a really dynamic set of interoperating economic um, and, and social relationships. And what I mean by that is we have not only people trying to export to the UK and to the EU using UK inputs to get to the EU, um, but we also have foreign affiliates based in the UK selling to the EU. Um, we have services, financial services, architectural uh, services, logistics really stand out for me, where you're also trying to move people around. Um, and you, we've got a, an incredibly rich relationship, uh, Canada's top innovation partners, with whom we do original research and development, include the US, the UK, France, Germany, but of course also Switzerland. And so uh, I have to say that the, the UK leaving the EU certainly introduced a level of, of complexity. We've not only offered uh, best practices from the Canada-EU relationship, but, but we've negotiated our own provisional trade agreement that's in force with the UK. And I think the key word here is interoperability. We're certainly very used to that. We have our trade agreement with the US uh, and now with um, our uh, relationship with Asia in the CPTPP, our bilateral uh, free trade agreements, uh, as well as, of course, the Canada-EU relationship. What we're, what we're trying to do is create an interoperable system so that a company can be based in Canada and have access to 1.5 billion of the world's richest consumers, as well as the WTO multilateral system uh, really underpinning all of that, which is why we're so committed uh, to WTO reform. But I think, you know, if I'm uh, reading between the lines of, uh, on this question, um, it's that we are 100% behind the UK um, as it works through its new relationships. And I think locking in and deepening our Canada-UK free trade agreement is really the key. And then we'll be able to, I think, assess with the other CPTPP members applications uh, to expand the agreement. There are other countries in Asia that have uh, indicated an interest in applying. And I think it's, I think it's fantastic to see uh, a, a dynamic uh, economy like the UK that I hope you don't mind me also injecting this. Part of, part of our, our kind of old fashioned uh, economic analysis has not gone away and that is competition. Competition is great for consumers. It creates variety. Um, it creates um, a, a products that meet demand, um, but also are affordable. And, and I don't think we should lose sight of that. That's what we lose when we become more protectionist. Uh, doesn't mean we don't focus on, on certain areas where we are absolutely going to experience nearshoring. But um, I think the real focus is, frankly, less here in Brussels. The EU has, has not told me that it's interested in joining the TPP, um, but it's back home uh, in, in Ottawa and in those capitals where uh, we're digging in deep to the UK's application. Thanks. Thank you, Ailish. We've nearly come to the end of our time. I have, um, I'll, I'll ask you two questions and you can choose which one to answer. One is, what's your view of the post-COVID world that we are emerging into? That's one. Or you may choose to answer the other question, which is, what do you think is the defining challenge of our times in international relations? Mm. I, I think uh, the defining moment now is a, a greater integration of intention around uh, the movement of people and our environment. So uh, I'm, I'm confident, I am bullish about the adaptability, ingenuity, uh, and ability to keep innovating um, when it comes to economic services, when it comes to, I think, fundamentally important social services that are domestically provided, like education. Um, the global issue that we have, I think, a dearth of collaboration in and where we, we're going to need even more to come out of the post-pandemic era more strongly is in the movement of people. Uh, in migration issues and also irregular migration, in part de uh, delivered uh, or, or driven by 
climate change. People are on the move, not because they want to be, but because either subsistence agriculture or areas are not safe anymore. So Canada is again, very committed to doing its part um, on resettlement, on issues around refugee, but uh, you know, there's fundamental issues of human security that are at stake here. Uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people were on the move after the second world war in Europe. And we've got to return to some of those lessons, I think, um, in order to take a look at the mass migrations we're seeing uh, that includes coming out of Syria, uh, comes out of the crisis in Venezuela and also in Africa. And the opportunities that we're going to confront coming out of the pandemic is on the good side, uh, a real temptation amongst governments to do nearshoring at the same time as we've used digital tools like we have today so that uh, I could speak to you while you're in Singapore and moderated by our incredible LSE team, David and Jess in London, thank you so much for moderating and making today possible. Uh, we're creating a global services, a global virtual services economy at the same time. Now, how all of these people that are on the move, that want dignity, that want the chance to have their children ed educated, how we as nations of very different, perhaps governmental organizations, but um, who have the capacity uh, to help these people, but also create the development opportunities in their countries of origin, you know, to, to really create the stability that's needed. Uh, this, this, along with climate change, will preoccupy us, and I have a feeling our children and grandchildren. Elish, thank you so much. We, this was incredible. Uh, I found it so thoughtful, reflective, inspiring. Uh, you've been, it's wide ranging. You've been very fluent uh, between the global and the personal, the macro and the micro, uh, the, the technical and the care and feeling, as you put it. Uh, so really, really, a complete treat all around for all of us. So thank you so much. Uh, and with that, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you also to the members of the audience uh, and hope to see you all again next time. Uh, but Ailish, thank you again. And this is the end of our time now. Thank you, Lutfi. Take care. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>